All right, it's 12 o'clock, so we'll go ahead and get started. Um, hello, everyone. Welcome to today's Department of Medicine Grand Rounds. For those of you who I haven't met, my name is Celia Herring. I'm one of the inpatient chief medical residents here at UW Montlake, and I'm very excited to be introducing today's speaker to you all. Um, so without further delay, Dr. Richard Johnson is a professor of medicine at the University of Colorado. Dr. Johnson is a clinician and a medical scientist who has been internationally recognized for his work on sugar and especially fructose and its product uric acid and how they may play a role in obesity and diabetes. He's been funded by the NIH and is widely published, including several books on the subject. Dr. Johnson did his medical residency and fellowships in both nephrology and infectious diseases here at University of Washington and was on faculty here from 1986 until 2000. Today, Dr. Johnson will be speaking to us all about fructose and uric acid, the double whammy driving metabolic diseases. And with that, I'll hand it over to you. Thank you. Thank you so much. Uh, you can all hear me, I hope. And uh, uh, it's really a great pleasure to come back and to talk to my friends and people that I, um, many of them are, are present here who uh, I worked with in the past. And it's just, a, it's a real delight to have this opportunity. Let's see if it's gonna work. Yeah, these are, oh, my disclosures. Um, you get some honorarium from different groups and I do have, uh, yeah, I guess this is the main disclosures. Um, so the cardiometabolic epidemic, you know, I mean, it's so apparent to all of us that there's an increase in obesity and diabetes, as well as in high blood pressure and heart disease. And although heart disease has been decreasing in recent years, a lot of that is because we're just getting more efficient at treating heart disease. And the actual reasons that drive heart disease are still there not just an increase in metabolic diseases like the classic ones we've talked about, but there's also an increase in frequency in, uh, in diseases that we don't uh, naturally just attribute to a metabolic disorder, but diseases like Alzheimer's disease and certain cancers that are associated with obesity, like breast cancer, colon cancer, liver cancer, and pancreatic cancer are also increasing. And in fact, we now recognize that old metabolic, metabolic syndrome has the classic association shown on the left. There are these other associations with metabolic syndrome on the right that include neurologic diseases, behavioral diseases, cancer, preeclampsia, sarcopenia, and even aging has been linked with metabolic syndrome. So today we're going to talk about uh, our insights into what might be driving this, these conditions. And although I've historically focused on the classic associations in this talk, we're gonna talk about some of the newer associations and how they might be related. So the big question is what are causing these epidemics? And of course, everyone has learned and has heard that, you know, it's, it's from bad habits that the problem is, is that the food is very uh, delicious and hard to resist. And, we are eating more and we definitely are eating more and we're being more inactive because of TV and all the stuff, the internet, ours, et cetera. And so the, it's really a, thought to be a disease, a tragedy of, you know, of our own success where we are uh, eating too much because the food's too palatable and easy to access and we're exercising too little. And the consequence is that the extra energy is stored as fat. But we know that altering behavior by eating less, and exercising more, it doesn't always work. It often works for a little while, but there's a big relapse rate. And so this raises the question that it may not just be a behavioral issue, but may in fact involve uh, you know, uh, biologic mechanisms. And in fact, what we've learned is that, you know, that, that uh, in the wild, animals regulate their weight very well. And uh, during the summer, animals generally will not increase their weight. If they eat more one day, they'll eat less the next. They kind of keep, they know how to regulate their weight. They know what percent body fat they want. And it's usually like 10, 15%. 
But when for some animals, they, they will purposely become fat like before hibernation or long distance migration or nesting. And these animals will suddenly, like uh, several months before the event, before the high, uh, winter comes or before they migrate, they'll start to change their behavior where they're eating more, they appear to be hungry more, uh, and you can show that they're developing leptin resistance where they don't uh, respond uh, well to leptin. And so leptin is a hormone that stimulates satiety. And so these animals seem to be uh, continually hungry and eating. They actually become insulin resistant, which may help maintain glucose levels in their blood for the brain when there's no food around because the brain can, can use some glucose uh, independent of insulin. And, um, and these animals will also store fat in their livers and in their, not just their adipose tissues, but in their blood. Uh, and really, when you look at it, you know, you say, my gosh, these guys are developing metabolic syndrome, but it's not pathophysiologic. This is what they need. It's like a type of fat storage that syndrome that they they need to survive because when they hibernate, they will burn that energy and that energy uh, or burn that fat and that fat will produce the energy they need. So in this scenario, it's the same equation. They're eating too much because they're hungry and leptin resistant and they're burning too little, they're burning less fat, but in this case, their fat oxidation process has been blocked. And the result is that uh, they they do increase their fat stores, but it's in this situation, we they are eating more because they remain hungry and they sit more because they have less energy. So what's the trigger that that triggers this? And could that be related to what happens to humans? Well, it's been known that some of these animals will eat large amounts of fruit in the fall that seems to coincide with the triggering of this biologic switch where they suddenly become hungry, left and resistant. And when I talk about eating fruit, I don't mean like eating one or two fruit a day. I mean like eating 10,000 grapes in a 24 hour period. And that's what the bear does. And it's, it's, a, it's sort of amazing uh, how much fruit they will eat. Well, fruit contains a sugar called fructose. And, um, and that's the main nutrient in, uh, in fruit. And fructose turns out to be very, very, um, it's a sugar that really can uh, switch animals into kind of being hungry and eating more and becoming and developing the metabolic syndrome. And if these were uh, our brothers from the same litter and one was offered fructose in the drinking water, the other one not. And in the first week or two, you know, when they're drinking the fructose, they'll eat less chow. They actually try to regulate their weight. But after about two or three weeks, that regulation of weight goes, goes to haste and, and the animals just start eating more and more and become fat. And in fact, our group uh, has identified that the, this biologic switch isn't just me metabolic syndrome. It stimulates hunger. It stimulates thirst. It stimulates foraging, all to help find food. It increases food intake uh, through causing leptin resistance. It drops resting energy metabolism, so it doesn't affect the foraging. But when they're not foraging, they actually kind of become like couch potatoes. They become insulin resistant, uh, which reduces glucose uptake in the muscle, uh, which also reduces energy metabolism, uh, stimulates inflammation, uh, kind of systemic inflammation. And it maintains blood pressure, uh, raises blood pressure, increases glomerular pressure and causes a shift to, uh, to glycolysis because mitochondria is, are inhibited, and this helps to reduce oxygen needs. So the question is, how does fructose activate this switch? And uh, I'm gonna try to show you here. This is kind of the key, quite, key figure. Uh, normally, um, when you, we think about food, we think of it as providing energy. And energy, we usually think of as active energy or ATP. This is what the mitochondria make and what we use to do things. So the classic thinking is that when you eat food, you're replacing the needed energy in the body. 
So you bring up the ATP, and when the ATP levels become high, the excess energy goes to fat. And this is what everyone was taught. But actually, that is not how it happens. When you eat fructose, and this seems to be a specific nutrient that does this, it lowers the ATP in a cell. And it does that by suppressing the mitochondria. Now, when you have a low ATP, that is sort of an alarm signal. It only reduces it like 25%. It doesn't reduce it to a, a life-threatening thing that leads to fight and flight responses and starvation responses. This drops the ATP 30%. And, and it's like the light goes up on the, on the dashboard that, that the fuel is low. And at the same time, it blocks the regeneration of the metabolism of fat to release ATP. So it, it creates a low energy state, a low active energy state. And then the calories, when they come in, because ATP is suppressed, they preferentially go to storing fat. It's a brilliant system. It's, it's like an alarm system that makes you think you're low in energy, even though you have fat. And for example, this was a paper that, uh, it's not our group, but it's another group, Lane's group. Uh, they gave glucose, they injected it into the brain and immediately ATP levels go up. The animals become uh, develop satiety. They actually show decreased food intake. But if you inject fructose, it's the exact opposite. ATP levels fall and you become hungry. And this really uh, is a great graphic example of how these two sugars that look almost identical, uh, the same molecular weight, but look, they have a very different effect on energy. Well, we actually went on to figure out how this works. It's really confusing and complicated. And I'm just going to point out that there's a caloric pathway where fructose is converted to energy and fat, like all calories. So, you know, so all foods have this caloric pathway. But there's also a non-caloric pathway activated by fructose. And that non-caloric pathway involves the cons rapid consumption of ATP driven by this enzyme called KHK or fructokinase. Then there's this removal of AMP through a specific enzyme called AMP deaminase. It generates uric acid in the process. Uric acid activates NADP ox NADPH oxidase that translocates to the mitochondria, inducing an oxidative stress that blocks ATP production. And it also inhibits an, an enzyme called AMP activated protein kinase. The result is you get a low ATP. So sorry about this slide, but this, this is what we've, this is just kind of shows a little bit ex, an example of it. If you take liver cells, you put fructose on them, you get this oxidative stress. You can block it with allopurinol, which is a drug that lowers uric acid. Some people think that xanthine oxidase produces it. Well, it does produce some oxidants on its own, but it, you can prove that it's the uric acid by adding back the uric acid and it, you get the oxidative stress. Uh, you can show it by specific markers of oxidative stress. It's actually not driven by the uric acid itself. It's from NADPH oxidase. And it's associated with the fat burst that you can block with allopurinol, recover with um, uric acid. So th these are kinds of studies that we do to show how it works. But this does bring up uric acid as a kind of a key player in how fructose works. And what's interesting, and I think many of you know this, is that humans have high uric acid levels compared to uh, most mammals, you know, and, and it's due to a mutation that occurred in, in an enzyme called uricase, you know, millions of years ago. And, and in fact, it's using molecular evolution, you can actually identify what the mutations were and when they occurred. And they occurred around 12 to 15 million years ago. And they involved not just the great apes, um, which involved, you know, orangutans, chimps, gorillas, and eventually also humans fall in this group, uh, but also lesser apes. And there were parallel mutations suggesting that there was some survival advantage uh, to, to having a higher uric acid. But why would that be? I mean, uric acid causes gout, you know, forms crystals. I mean, that's not a survival advantage. You'd have trouble escaping a predator if you had gout. 
So why would the mutation occur? What was the survival advantage? So interestingly, I, I got, I have a love of anthropology and evolution and, and people, my friends listening know this. And, uh, and I, you know, so I started reading about what was going on back in 50 years ago. And it turns out that the first apes evolved in East Africa around 20 million years ago. They were fruit eating. They lived in the trees. They were successful within a few million years. There were 30 species. There's only five species of ape today. And, um, you know, there's 30 species in five, a few million years. It was a very, very productive time. We call it the, like the tr uh, Garden of Eden. But then uh, global cooling, began, not global warming. There was a fall in temperatures, polar ice caps formed. And a land bridge developed between Africa and Euro Asia, and, and many animals, including these apes, migrated into Europe. So for a while, we had apes in Europe. Um, and these apes, uh, uh, you know, as global cooling continued, initially there, were, there was uh, fruit all year round, and it was pretty much similar to Africa. But as it got cooler, in Europe, it got more colder than in Africa and Suddenly the trees were changing, they became more deciduous, fruits were less available during this cooler months. There started be, being some savannas. And these poor guys that were used to just eating fruit started to starve. They actually came out of the trees. It was a period of a uh, very rapid evolution of, of our ancestors. Uh, and it was also a period of great extinction. 30% of all species went extinct around 10, 12 million years ago. That starvation, you can see evidence for it in the ape teeth that have been recovered in Europe from that time. They often show these rings which relate to seasonal loss of enamel or poor enamel growth in growing teeth during the uh, cooler seasons. Uh, and then uh, a P Peter Andrews had shown that, they, that based on the fossil record though, that humans are actually derived from a European ape. But the European apes went extinct, but there's now evidence that some of them migrated back to Africa and some of them went to Asia. And because uh, they all share this Eurocase mutation from that time, we think that the mutation occurred in Europe. Now, interestingly, uh, I was able to reach Peter Andrews, the, the guy who, you know, with the nature papers and all this. And I flew to London and went to the Museum of Natural History and met with, his, with Peter and, and this is the story he told me. And, and so we, I told him about the Eurocase mutation. And together we began to think, you know, could the Eurocase mutation have provided a survival factor for those animals? And how could it have done that? And we realized that it would have increased the uric acid response in, re, in response to fructose because there would be no Eurocase to, to uh, degrade it. And uh, instead of making a lantern, uh, their uric acid levels would go up. So we came up with this theory that maybe when the fruit were becoming less available, that this mutation allowed the animals to convert fruit more easily into fat to create, generate the fat that would allow them to survive the winters. And, and that this kind of mutation and under such severe pressure, natural pressure, natural selection pressures might actually have rapidly taken over the species. So to look at that, uh, uh, Dr. Gabi Sanchez Lozada in uh, Mexico City uh, did a study with us in which she took animals, uh, rats that had the uricase, and she inhibited the, the uricase with the uricase inhibitor. And she found that when she did that, she could augment the uric acid response, and even small amounts of fructose could, could cause insulin resistance, raise blood pressure, increase body weight, et cetera. So we could show that this mutation acted synergistically to increase the ability of fructose to cause fat. And then uh, we were really lucky. I met up with a guy named Eric Gausher who uh, uh, knew how to resurrect extinct genes and he re resurrected the extinct uric case and we showed the same thing. So there was this theory a long time ago by a guy named James Neal that maybe there's this thing called the thrifty gene where you get a mutation during a period of famine that helps you survive. And then uh, in today's world, makes you uh, a little bit too reactive and too responsive so that the food, when you eat food, you be rapidly 
um, become uh, fat. So we we started. I started thinking about this, and I actually found that that, that you know I thought to myself, well, what about the great apes? Do they have a high uric acid? And they do, but you know the great apes that have this uricase mutation, they only double their uric acids. And also, we got blood samples from Yanomami Indians who live on native diets. Now they live on a a fruit diet as well as other things, but their uric acids are only around three. But the big surprise, not a big surprise. I'm kidding. It's not a big surprise. Um, but sugar intake has gone up dramatically. And with sugar intake has gone up dramatically, you know, so has uric acid levels. So in 1920 in the United States, the mean uric acid level was three and a half. Five was considered markedly elevated back then. Then by 1960, five and a half was the mean and six and a half was viewed as really high. And today, you know, it's not uncommon to have uric acids of six. And so now it's seven or some places say eight is high. So we keep changing our, you know, what's what's high because every decade it's going up and it's going up because of the sugar and the alcohol and, and all the foods we're eating that are driving the uric acid up. So now, you know, maybe 20% of the population have hyperuricemia, especially in men. And, and when you look at the relationship of uric acid to obesity, it is pretty dramatic. I never thought it was this dramatic, but look at this. This is uh, from the N. Haynes. It, there's a stepwise increase in uric acid with obesity. There's a stepwise increase with diabetes. There's a stepwise increase with hypertension. And there's even more of an asymptotic arise with with uh, kidney disease it is there there is a relationship that cannot be denied but that doesn't mean causality but our work suggested that it could and when we've lowered uric acid we could block some of these effects so we've gone on to try to understand how how it does it cause weight gain and we found that fructose does it through leptin resistance and the way you prove leptin resistance is you have to inject the animal with leptin. And normally when you inject an animal with leptin, they will reduce their food intake for about 12 hours. And you can measure that uh, over, you know, like a 24 hour. And when you give them fructose, they become completely resistant to leptin. Leptin doesn't work at all. And as you probably know, most people with obesity have been found to have leptin resistance. And we found that that was what was responsible for weight gain. And, uh, you know, because they eat more and that does it. And if you block the ability for them to eat more, they won't gain weight. So weight gain is really a calorie based problem. And fat intake, you know, when you become leptin resistant, you also start liking fat more, as you probably are aware. And when you eat more fat, um, that really accelerates weight gain because you're leptin resistant. On the other hand, we found that uh, the mitochondrial effects of, le of fructose was what drove all these metabolic diseases. In fact, we could put animals on caloric restriction and reduce their calories a lot. But if they ate sugar, they could, would become diabetic, hypertensive, fatty liver, et cetera. Okay, well, it's great to say fructose is important, probably is, but what about cultures that don't eat a lot of sugar? I mean, it's not that they don't get obesity. What about the emperor penguin who gets fat without, and there's no fruit down in Antarctica. So there've got to be other mechanisms. Well, the big surprise was that fructose can be made from glucose. And we've known this, but we never knew how important it was. But there's this pathway called the polyol pathway where glucose is converted to fructose. And this is the only way fructose is made in the body. And when what, what drives it? Guess what drives it? High carb diet, high glycemic carbs, diabetes, you can take a diabetic person who has bad glucose control. You, they, you don't have to feed them any fructose. They all have high fructose levels, of blood uh, levels and urine levels of fructose. Uh, it's well published. And likewise, if you give animals carbs uh, or even humans carbs, you can measure a rise in fructose production, both production and levels of, with that. So it turns out that you can make fructose from carbs. And that's really important because there's a lot of these carbs called, called high glycemic carbs, starchy foods like rice, potatoes, cereal, bread, 
And if you eat those, your glucose levels go up. And what, as your glucose levels go up, you can convert as much as 30% of that glucose to fructose. So it's not the 3% in a normal, uh, you know, under normal, high, normal glycemic conditions. When it goes up, it can, the amount of fr fructose produced goes way up. And we could show that in animals by giving them glucose, showing that their fructose levels go up, they become fat, they become insulin resistant. And if we block that fructokinase enzyme, that KHK enzyme, we could block obesity. Now there was some obesity that was being driven by, by the insulin. And we were able to show that there's really two mechanisms. There's an insulin dependent mechanism and there's a fructose dependent mechanism. And fructose makes up about half of the effects and, and glucose insulin makes up about half the effects. And this is a study just published uh, showing that fructose levels go up in the blood of people taking an oral glucose tolerance test uh, but there's, you know, multiple studies. There. Well, once we realized that carbs could cause obesity through this, this explained why a low carb diet was so effective. And if you go on a low carb diet or a keto diet, you're going to block both the fructose you eat and the fructose you make. And, um, and that's why you can go on a high fat diet and you, you won't get fat. So a high fat, high protein diet. But we also realized that that salt and, and low oxygen, there are these different things that can activate this enzyme that could convert glucose to sorbitol. And we know that animals like salt and it's been associated, salt licks are, it's sodium chloride salt licks that count and they actually, your animals will eat it before winter and it helps them gain weight. And in fact, some groups give salt to try to stimulate weight gain uh, at, you know, uh, in domesticated animals. Well, when we put animals on salt and we were able to put salt in the drinking water, we had to add a little sucralose, but we had sucralose in the controls uh, and sucralose does not cause weight gain or obesity or metabolic syndrome. But anyway, we found that when we gave salt that it took a longer time. It's like instead of three weeks to become leptin resistant, really it was like three months. And, but eventually the animals really became fat I mean, like really fat, they became diabetic, they became uh, hypertensive, uh, you know, they developed a lot of these, these findings. And, uh, and if we blocked fructokinase, even if they ate all the same amount of salt, they did not develop metabolic syndrome and they didn't develop high blood pressure and they were protected from cardiac hypertrophy. In fact, what we learned was that the way salt works is through this pathway that it's not about the amount of salt. It's about the, uh, the bringing the salt concentration up in the blood and then that activating this pathway. And in fact, we did studies, I won't show them, but you can give salt to people. And if you give salt, blood pressure goes up. If you give salt with water so that osmolality doesn't change, they don't get high blood pressure. And we did this too. We also found that fructose also increases serum osmolality. It's dehydrating it actually shifts water into the cells with glycogen formation. And if we gave water, we could actually suppress some of this weight gain and uh, we could suppress uh, th this pathway. So then we were also uh, started thinking about umami foods. And if you look on the far left here, you'll see that um, when ATP is degraded to make uric acid, it makes AMP and IMP and so this is part of the pathway that we're, we've identified that drives obesity. But when you ate, eat monosodium glutamate, which is this flavor that causes uh, the savory flavor of umami, it gets converted into AMP and to, uh, to, to uric acid. And in fact, if you put MSG, which is, you know, this added to make food taste better, it's like commonly used in Chinese restaurants. When it's added, animals uh, will start drinking more and more of it. They like it and they suddenly become left and resistant and they start eating more. Their uric acid goes up, their ATP levels fall and uh, you can amplify it with AMP or IMP. These are also in that pathway. Uh, and um, we were able to show this. This has you know, been shown to, to amplify the uh, umami taste. So the umami taste is driven by MSG and IMP, and you can really make a powerful umami by combining it. And we could show that it could cause 
obesity as well. So it's entering this pathway. And we even could uh, find that uric acid, if we put uric acid in the drinking water, increase food intake, and not, not the elantron, remember this is mutation. And uh, uh, so the elantron doesn't, but the uric acid does it. It's fatty liver and increase obesity. And glutamate intake is a leech with obesity in China. The good news is we don't eat a lot of this stuff. It's really sugar that drives obesity. But it's interesting that you can activate this pathway uh, different ways. And in fact, what we now know is that this complicated, it's a complicated pathway where sugar can provide fructose or glucose that can be converted to fructose. Salt can accelerate this. Low water intake can um, accelerate this. That, that, that umami can come in and join in this pathway here. And there's actually an amplification loop that's really of uh, interest. And so you can see that this all leads to a low ATP and this makes you hungry. These are just calories uh, and they, they're not gonna actually do much, but this is where it's at. So uh, in the next few minutes, I'm gonna show you how powerful this pathway is and how it can explain so many diseases um, and just keeps getting more important. So let me show you how this works. So remember that, you know, there's all these different mechanisms that seem to be active, but one of the mechanisms is it reduces mitochondrial function. The mitochondria use oxygen to make ATP. So that's sort of a way to reduce oxygen. And there was this nice paper in Science showing that the naked mole rat uh, survives in those uh, hypoxemic burrows by switching on to fructose metabolism. So fructose metabolism gets turned on um, and through the polyol pathway. And the fructose, um, as it's a fuel that, that shifts you from oxidative phosphorylation to glycolysis, it allows the animals to survive. So if you take a naked mole rat, um, it can live without oxygen for a much longer time than a mouse that hasn't learned how to turn that on so well. So uh, hypoxia, fructose can be used to help support, save animals in hypoxic states. By the way, uric acid was shown to do that in, in a whole variety of animals by, uh, by naturalists uh, unrelated to medical biology. Uh, um, but anyway, so if you, so this is by Lou Cantley, nice paper, and he found that when he puts animals on high fructose corn syrup, that they drop their ATP, they go, stimulates glycolysis. It's basically the Warburg effect, tumors metastasize. And I can't tell you how, I'm at a conference right now down here in Las Vegas where all these people are talking about how keto diets can help cancers. In fact, this morning I got requested by, by a group that's found that this is true for glioblastomas. And, um, and you know, there is this uh, big rage that diet is more important than cancer growth. And we did this study, if you knock out uricase and you inject breast tumor cells in into, uh, into a mouse, they metastasize like wild. And you can show that different ways. Um, and it's because of this Warburg effect. And in fact, you know, Mendelian randomization and uh, um, uh, different types of analysis, multivariate analysis shows that uric acid uh, increases the risk for cancers. What about Alzheimer's? Well, for a long time, Alzheimer's is, you know, we, we know it's this bad disease, cerebral atrophy, uh, brain shrinks, there's these amyloid plaques, tau protein aggregates, I mean, it's a horrible disease. It's like the seventh most common cause of death uh, and it's increasing and everyone's scared of it. And I think all of us should be scared of it because it's the disease you don't want to get. And then all this push to try to block the amyloid plaques, but gosh, you know, 25 drugs uh, tested and, you know, some borderline benefit. It's really not the thing. So people are saying, okay, look, if it's not the amyloid plaque. What's causing it? So they say, well, what, what are the key things you see before people develop a full-blown amyloid? And they found that there's three main findings. There's an, the development of insulin resistance in the brain, 
there's mitochondrial dysfunction and low ATP and inflammation. And my God, that's part, that's what the biologic switch does. You know, so it makes you think, could fructose be involved? And, you know, the conditions that kind of increase the risk are conditions like metabolic syndrome, obesity, diabetes, the foods associated with our sugar, high glycemic carbs, high salt diets. Well, you know, it's, it's this, it looks very similar. And if you look at NHANES, you find that sugar intake correlates with memory defects. The more sugar you have, the Worse you are at long, uh, at both delayed and short-term memory. It's associated with low brain volume. It's associated with atrophy of the brain. It's associated with shrinkage of the hippocampus, which is the main memory center. Uh, and, I mean, you know, with a relationship with sugar intake. So what happens if you give sugar? What happens if you give fructose to a mouse? Guess what? They have trouble getting through a maze. You can show it within a few weeks and it will persist even after stopping the sugar for a while. So they have trouble getting through a maze. They have, suddenly they become insulin resistant in the brain. They have impaired signaling. They have oxidative stress. They have a fall in mitochondrial ATP. It's like, it's like the same story. And over time, they start getting tau protein and amyloid plaques. I mean, that is, it's really strong evidence that this is important. Diet is important and it's really scary. And in fact, um, a recent study looked at, uh, at dementia in diabetic animals. These are DB. DB is the diabetic animal. MM is the non-diabetic. And the diabetic animal were found to have high fructose in their hippocampus, high expressions of the fructose transporter, high expression of fructokinase in their hippocampus. It turned out to be in the microglia, low ATP, learning problems where they have a latency, a long time to to learn something, right? And, and uh, they, they have this water maze they, and how long they take to get there. And then what they did is they knocked out fructokinase only in the brain, only in the hippocampus. They did it with antisense. This isn't my study. Uh, and the, they treated it. The treated animals start off not being able to uh, to learn very well, but they improve. They be, they actually, their dementia improved. They, they finally, they, their latency time, they learned how to do it. And they also learned how to find the platforms because they moved the platforms around. So like a, a learning thing. So you can improve when you knock down the fructose. And so, so what's causing the fructose uh, in their brain? Well, it turns out that the number one risk factor is high baseline or high postprandial glucose or, and insulin resistance. And so this was a study done in, at Yale by Sherwin, brilliant guy. He used magnetic resonance spectroscopy. This is a human study. He raised blood glucose to 220 in healthy humans. And then he shows that the brain is making fructose, very significant fructose, a 45 minute delay. And then it's there. And guess what? In Alzheimer's disease, high fructose levels, five to seven fold compared to age match controls, low ATP, high sorbitol, high AMP deaminase, high, all the things we're looking for, they're all there. And guess what? New studies, metabolomics, 376 uh, metabolites, one predicts Alzheimer's. It's way off the chart. Guess what it is? That's it, uric acid. And other studies, there's another one with 450, no, 40, 45, uh, uh, different risk factors. And again, uric acid was the only one, both Mendelian randomization and, uh, and predicting. So what we think of, I think this is the cause of Alzheimer's. Junk food, processed food, causes obesity, fructose goes up in the brain, uric acid produced, myoglial activation, Alzheimer's. But why would that happen? Well, the problem is, is that foraging is an actual biologic response. It's, there's some things about it that's good. You know, it's like being a scout. You have to be an adventurer. You have to go into dangerous areas. You have to be an explorator. You have to have all these kinds of exp exploratory behavior and so forth, minimal deliberation. You have to move in, move out, find that food. It's actually a survival mechanism. It's actually a wonderful thing. You know, explorers, adventurers, Indiana Jones, we think of all these guys, you know, I mean, these are heroes, right? Well, how does it do it? Well, when you eat fructose, it activates your ability to find food. It's called the visual cortex, that little red dot 
red light there. Fructose activates that, makes you find the food. This is human studies. Here's a in the middle study here. This is, you know, 15 minutes. Now, during the first 15 minutes, glucose is not being converted to fructose. So that things change after this. But this is really a glucose effect. Glucose increases blood flow to the brain. It wants you to think well. Fructose decreases it because it wants to block self-control. It wants, it wants you to be uh, more impulsive. It wants you to be able to go out there and find things. It doesn't want you to think about the lion that's out there. And it will decrease the blood flow to the hippocampus as well. And the reason is because it doesn't want you to remember how dangerous it is out there. And if you similar sort of things, if you knock out your case, this was from the NIH studies, your case uh, be nice, show exploratory behavior, excitatory behavior. They start foraging, they, get, they, they move faster initially. And, uh, and, and this is a study in humans you know, impulsivity, excitement seeking are associated with uh, uric acid. So this could potentially explain it, uh, behavioral disorders. And look at this. Um, uh, this is, uh, you know, ADHD is increasing. Bipolar disease is increasing. Both of them are associated with sugar intake. But like here, you know, it's been well known that sugar and high fructose corn syrup intake are associated with these diseases. They're increasing dramatically in our population. And uh, and guess what? Recent study, this one just came out a few weeks ago. People who with ADHD actually can forage more effectively than normal people. This is a study where they take these, they go online and they try to capture, catch berries or find berries. And, you know, they see how long, and they, it's a situation where it become less and less frequent and you may have to go to a new area. Well, the people with ADHD, they switch more quickly to look, look, you know, when things start getting less, they just go to a new area very impulsively and they find a hell of more berries. It is an advantage if you're a forager, you, it's an advantage to have a little bit of ADHD. You're going to get there, you're going to find your food. And this is a bipolar disease. It's also associated with like, you know, insulin resistance, hyperuricemia, you know. Actually, lithium was first given uh, for hyperuricemia and, uh, and because of lower uric acid. And then it was found to be very helpful for bipolar disorder. And bipolar disorder is really associated with high uric acids. Interestingly here, uh, this, again, fructose levels are very high in the brains of patients with bipolar disease, both in the parenchyma, it's in the cerebral spinal fluid that correlates directly with hospitalizations. It is a real association, and we kind of know why. And keto diets, as you probably know, have been found to really be beneficial uh, in early studies. These are kind of pilot studies, but they everyone seems to be improving with bipolar and so forth kind of diseases. So, so in summary, we've shown that, you know, excess fructose is driving a lot of these conditions. Uh, it's also associated with heart disease. And what we know is that should you not eat fruit? No, eat fruit. Eat fruit has small amounts of fructose. It has a lot of good things like vitamin C and flavonols that counter the effects of fructose. What you don't want to be eating is or drinking is soft drinks. We've uh, been evolving, uh, you know, uh, the wrong way, at least in the last uh, few years. And I want to thank all the people who worked with me. And, you know, I want to say special thanks to Raymond Pigler and uh, Carol Bombstick and my, my good friends from the University of Washington. My, some of my, my best times in my life were uh, at that university and working with you guys. And I really appreciate everything and the opportunity to present. So we now have uh, a little bit of time to take questions. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. Much, Dr. Johnson. Yeah. Um, if folks um, do have any other questions, any other questions they, haven't they haven't submitted yet, submitted. please go ahead and put them in the chat at this point. Um, but we'll start with the ones that have come in already. Uh, there was a question, is there a threshold at which fructose begins to lower ATP or does it do this at any dose? And does fructose have a linear dose dependent effect on ATP? We don't have exactly know the answer to that, but I can tell you that it, there is a, it's sort of like a dimmer switch. 
And, um, and if there's a high concentration of fructose, the ATP depletion is much worse than at, at, with a low level. So there is a, there is a dose dependency. I don't, and uh, depending, we, we can see like, uh, I mean, like studies have been done with using NMR to show in vivo ATP depletion in humans with fructose. And you can get like a 30 or 40% fall in ATP in the liver with like a, you know, 30 ounce soft drink. And so, so we know it happens. We, it's been proven in humans. Um, and uh, it's, it's clinically relevant to soft drinks. And we did do this really cool study, actually. So we, we did a study where we gave apple juice, which is really high in fructose. And we gave a pretty significant amount of apple juice to volunteers that where they either had to drink it in five minutes or they drank it over an hour. So if you, it turns out that if you sip fructose just over like an hour, hour or two, you don't get the ATP depletion nearly with the same amount of fructose taken fast. And that's probably because of the constant, it's the concentration that hits the liver that's important. That concentration is dependent on not only the amount, but the rapidity and also whether or not there's other food in the intestines that blocks absorption. There's this really interesting thing, you know, like if you eat a piece of bread, your blood glucose goes up. If you put avocado on the same piece of bread, it doesn't go up, you know, because it slows the absorption. It's the same story here, the fructose. And, and what we showed in that experiment was that blood pressure shot up right away with when you drank the apple juice fast, uh, that you activated, you know, uh, this pathway that causes, we could show activation of the pathway that I don't want to go into all the detail, but there is a blood test called copeptin or vasopressin that's activated by fructose uh, when you activate the switch. And uh, so you can tell if the switch is being activated, but it is a dimmer. It is a dimmer. So, you know, large dose, big effect, small dose, maybe no effect. You know, I, I, I think, I don't want to tell you this, but if you ate a piece of cake and you just ate like one little piece, you know, and then when you eat 10 minutes to eat the next one, you could probably eat it. It would just be a calorie or like a soft drink. But the trouble is, it tastes so good. You're not going to eat it over an hour or two hours. You're not going to finish that so over two hours. You're going to drink it fast. And the poor kids out there in the tennis court that are guzzling these soft drinks when they're, when they're thirsty and uh, dehydrated, this is the equation for obesity. Thank you. You're welcome. The next question that I'll pose to you is, what is your take on ketogenic diets for the treatment of Alzheimer's disease? You know, there's some, you know, there's a guy named Chris Palmer who's been, uh, had a book called Brain Energy, and he's like talking mainly about, about behavioral disorders, but there are actually papers out there uh, also on keto diets you know, preliminary data showing benefit in Alzheimer's to some extent. It's got to be early Alzheimer's. There's some uh, evidence that GLP-1 agonists may actually have some benefit too, even though we all hate GLP-1 agonists. <laughs> but, but yeah, I think it's, uh, you know, if you are a, you know, worried about yourself or you have someone that you're taking care of that, you know, a family member, really get the sugar out of the house. Don't let them eat too much high glycemic carbs and give it a go. Try a keto diet. There are definitely cases where people have improved. Uh, it's very pilot, um, but I think it's good. You know, there's this thing called a wandering response where um, people with Alzheimer's like will wander off and they, they, you know, they get lost. They get in cars and drive off into the sunset. And I mean, it's really a horrible thing. It's like six out of 10 or seven out of 10 people with Alzheimer's have that, that's probably a foraging response. You know, it's probably related. Likewise, there's, I don't know, I, I, I know I know it must be written about, but most, a lot of people with Alzheimer's just have a sweet tooth and they want to eat, continue to eat sugar. It's, it's, it's real. So I would, I would really, you know, I mean, if it's end stage Alzheimer's, let them eat their sugar because you're not going to really do much. Right. But uh, if you're trying to, stop it from advancing. I think go on a low carb diet 
do everything. And actually, there's a guy named Dale Bredesen. Have you read his books, Cure Alzheimer's? He actually, you know, uh, does all these maneuvers. But one of the big ones is to get sugar and carbs down. And um, and I've I've worked with him. He actually co-authored one of our papers on Alzheimer's. Uh, he's brilliant. And uh, yeah, you might want to read his stuff. And, you know, vitamins too, like thiamine uh, helps improve mitochondrial energy. Uh, uh, vitamin C is a mitochondrial antioxidant. Uh, you know, B12 is always good. You know, so the, the B and, and C vitamins probably are very helpful too. Um, I had a case report where I had a, you know, someone come up with kind of a Korsakoff and Wernicke type syndrome, totally out of it, gave him IV thiamine. And he just woke up and his ass, you know, they get this lactic acidosis. It's like a glycolytic thing, you know, it's, it's not too different, actually. It's just reversible because people is so dramatic. But There were a handful of questions that came in about your thoughts on um, different medications. I think I'm going to start with your thoughts about metformin as a potential therapy to interrupt these pathways. Metformin is fantastic. Uh, I mean, it's got problems, right? But um, but it actually stimulates uh, AMPK, which is a really important thing for helping to maintain ATP. It blocks AMP deaminase, which is this enzyme. It's just it's a really poor inhibitor. But it's you know, but it activates things that are all good, you know, and it does, it's associated with mild weight loss and some improvement in insulin resistance. Uh, I think it's a good, it's a good player. Uh, you know, obviously it can cause lactic acidosis and it's kind of a chemical poison in some respects, but, but basically, you know, you want to do everything you can to improve the metabolic milieu and metformin does that. What else? Uh, your thoughts on whether we should all be taking allopurinol? I just sent David Perlmutter. He's a neurologist, you know, fantastic uh, character. And uh, I found five papers that show that going on a xanthine oxidase inhibitor is associated with a reduced risk for Alzheimer's. In one study, it was like a 60% reduction with febuxostat. I mean, it was amazing. Some of them are kind of like borderline, but there are there's none that are negative, and I mean none that are that show the opposite effect. And you know, out of five studies, like four are positive, and one's kind of like borderline. I I I I I'm really keen that that might be a great great way to go. Now these are epidemiologic studies where they look at people on allopurinol, uh, and uh, in some of them, just look at allopurinol versus the general population, and others look at allopurinol versus untreated hyperuricemia. So we think I think hyperuricemia is bad, right? So if you go if you have a uric acid of eight and you go on allopurinol and you take it down to seven, I'm not sure you would see as much benefit. So the studies really need to be done right, but most of the studies show that if you just are in the general population and you are on a xanthine oxidase inhibitor, you have a reduced risk for uh, for Alzheimer's. So I th I'm I'm pro, but I want to see it proven. <laughs> yeah, that's very interesting. Yeah. Um, the other medication folks brought up in their questions uh, is SGLT2 inhibitors. And if you think it's time to look for effects that those might have outside of the sort of diabetes, renal, and heart oh, disease. I, so SGLT inhibitors, they lower uric acid. And it, it's through this gly, glycosuric effect. And, um, you know, there's some studies suggesting that this is like part of how SGLT2 inhibitors might work. We also think that what, what an SGLT2 inhibitor does is it blocks the glucose reabsorption into the kidney and uh, in diabetics, and that may prevent fructose formation in the, in, in the kidney uh, with activation of the polyol pathway. You know? So uh, I like SGLT2 inhibitors, 
And I think the uric acid lowering benefit might have real significance on some other conditions. And we just talked about, you know, there's behavioral conditions. There's, and I didn't even talk about the heart disease section. I, I took that out because I was worried about time. But, you know, there, this whole pathway is like really turning out to be potentially important, not just in metabolic diseases, but like neurologic diseases, cancer, uh, preeclampsia, and other conditions. And so I, I, I'm kind of big on SGLT2 inhibitors. I think they're good. All right. Um, the next one is, so we're always encouraged to eat fresh food, fresh fruit, which obviously contains fructose. Is there a difference between the source of fructose and um, what might be coming from a different sort, fruit derived source yeah, rather than high fructose so me, corn syrup? No, I think fructose is fructose. But if it's uh, in a fruit, you've got fiber slowing the absorption. You've got all these other things that are blocking and we can show that we can block some of the fructose effects with potassium, and fruits are often rich in potassium, with vitamin C. We did this really cool study. I'll tell you this. So we haven't published it, but, um, but we've presented it. If you knock out vitamin C um, synthesis in a mouse, you know, mice can make vitamin C. We lost the ability to make vitamin C 65 million years ago during the, during the uh, dinosaur extinction. Okay, that's when we we lost the vitamin C ability to make vitamin C. But if you take a vitamin C knockout mouse and you put it, you have to give it some fructose, I'm sorry, some vitamin C, or it will get scurvy. So you put all the animals on low doses of vitamin C, and then you one group, you give a high dose of vitamin C. Now you can see what vitamin C does to fructose. And what we did is we put the animals on high fructose corn syrup, and we found that they all drink the same amount of high fructose corn syrup. But the ones that had high vitamin C were less fat. They were significantly less fat. They developed less metabolic syndrome. And actually, you can find beautiful papers showing vitamin C has a mild effect on metabolic syndrome. I mean, it's like meta-analyses. It's like, you know, it's like real, you know. So high doses of vitamin C probably blunt the development of metabolic syndrome. So you can imagine... When a fruit is ripening, the vitamin C content is high, but a lot of fruits, as they ripen, the vitamin C goes down and the sugar content goes up. That's great for animals. It's the synergy between the animals and plants because the ripe fruit are picked and then the ripe fruit have the seeds that will germinate and, you know, it helps everybody. Um, but we tend to eat tartar fruit that is higher in vitamin C. We like tartar fruit. And this is a good news. Because, you know, now you have high vitamin C, epicatechin, flavanols, all these things that help counter the fructose effects. But when you drink a soft drink, <laughs> there's not, nothing to counter it. Um, since we're on the topic of vitamin C, we'll jump to one that just came in. So behaviors that prevent vitamin C absorption, such as excess tea consumption, might predispose to metabolic syndrome? Well, tea, I think, is generally associated with good effects. And some of the teas, actually, we have one lady that worked with us who found that certain teas actually have some inhibitory effects on fructokinase. Um, and uh, she wrote a K award. You know, so it, it's uh, it's a mixed bag. I, I would say what kind of tea. And, you know, certain teas like green tea, gosh, they're good. You know, for sure it's good. So I, I'm not... Sure. But yeah, if you blocked vitamin, if you became, so people with, with obesity will have a lower vitamin C level than people without obesity. That's been published and there's a nice relationship. So everyone should, Linus Pauling should have gotten a third Nobel Prize. <laughs> yeah. Vitamin C is really, is better than, you know, he, he got scoffed for pushing vitamin C, but uh, probably, it, we're probably not on enough of it. And that mutation of vitamin C was probably a thrifty gene as well. It was to lose it was to reduce the vitamin C to enhance the fruit uh, ability to, to store fat at a time of a massive extinction that took out 80% of species. All right. Um, I'm seeing that it's one o'clock and I think a few people are starting to have to drop off. That yeah. said, I do have a couple more questions remaining in the chat. And if you have 
time, I'm happy to stay on and, and do a couple more minutes, but up to you, Dr. Johnson. Yeah, I, I'm using someone's office that I see them sitting there. Let's do two questions and I better go. All right, I'll try to pick the best two yeah. here. Um, okay. I'm curious about this one, your thoughts on diet soda instead of regular soda. Well, uh, so diet sodas, um, you know, there's so many aspects there, but um, in a quick, so the, the first thing is if you knock out the, the taste receptors, which we did, an animal doesn't care about diet sugars because the diet sugar, the craving for it is all through the tongue dopamine pathway, but they still like fructose, even if they can't taste it because it's the metabolism, it's that drop in ATP that drives the craving. Uh, and so there is a difference, but it is said that when you eat, drink sweet drinks, um, that it, it keeps you liking sweets. And maybe that's not so good in a world filled with sugar. And of course, all these things have their different side effects, and so forth associated with it. Now I will tell you a uh, disclosure, I, I'm now half-time university. Raymond, you may not know this. I'm half-time university and I'm half-time working with a company called Rx Sugar that makes a low-calorie sugar. It's natural sugar. It's, it's a natural, it's called a rare sugar that looks like fructose, but it's an epimer and it's called allulose. And that sugar does not activate this pathway. For sure, we've proven that it does not activate it and it stimulates GLP-1, so it tends to lower, uh, it tends to lower postprandial glucose. It causes weight loss in, in animals, and uh, you know, so it's like a natural zempic. It looks very, very exciting. Um, so take that for what you will. I, I'm trying to, I'm joined it as a science officer to try to figure out you know, make sure it's safe and all that. But it's generally regarded as safe. It's in all the markets and you know, it may be a good way to go. I, you know, I don't, it also probably lowers uric acid because uh, it causes, it's sort of like an SGLT2 inhibitor. It causes the sugar gets into the urine and, and drag uric acid. With it. So, so it might be a good guy. But most diet sugar, my recommendation in general, if you want to eat something sweet, eat a fruit. If you if you really want to do it well, drink water, try to avoid sweets. But sometimes we just want to eat a sweet and occasional sugar is okay. Have a cake on your birthday. But, you know, we do, I think diet sugars may have, still have a role for uh, people who really can't uh, get rid of the desire to eat a sweet. All right. And then the last question that I'll have you leave us with is about whether you know if there are prospective human studies in development on fructose and new onset Alzheimer's disease. No, but I uh, actually, um, this guy, Chris Palmer, just got a huge grant uh, at Harvard to study some of these pathways. And uh, we're probably going to be collaborating with him. Um, I think that this is a super hot topic. And uh, God, I would like to see, you know, we, we, there was a movement to try to develop fructokinase inhibitors. There are several companies working on it. I have a little company trying to work on it. That's my dream is to make a drug that not only helps metabolic disease like diabetes and obesity, but we really need something to block the development of Alzheimer's. And because there's so many foods that can activate this pathway, we, it may be difficult to just do on one type of diet. But for sure, a low carb keto diet will be the most effective current way to reduce this possibility. If in fact, I mean, the data looks so strong. I just can't believe it's not, not the mechanism. Could be wrong though. <laughs> all right, well, thank you very much, Celia. And uh, thank you all for inviting me. I, uh, you know, missed my days at, at Washington and, uh, at Seattle and, and uh, really wish you all well. Uh, and Petter Bornstedt, who was my, I mentored, he's coming out to run the Diabetes Center starting in March there. And, uh, and he's a fantastic, uh, will be a fantastic addition. Thank you.
Awesome. Thank you so much, Dr. Johnson. That was a really robust uh, question series we had coming through the chat. So thank you for that stimulating discussion. And thank you to everybody who was able to attend today and participate. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah. And I'll look yeah, forward to seeing you. everybody back next month. Thank okay. you all. Thank you. Bye-bye.